So we know what Texans look like, or at least how they appear to outsiders. And we know that slavery and the growth of the plantation economy is going to help drive settlement to Texas. But where do people settle in Texas? Well, that's pretty easy. They um, settle east of present-day I-35, but they come from different parts of the South. Well, and even the Midwest. For instance, in North Texas, you have people that are coming in from Tennessee, Kentucky, and the Midwest, southern Indiana, uh, places like Illinois, even Ohio, and Missouri. So they're coming in, and they're probably getting as far south as, say, present-day Waco. Uh, But from Waco south and certainly to the east and into south Texas, uh, Texas is really about being from the deep south. And that really starts to shape that culture in that part of the state. But at the same time, Texas is remarkably multicultural in that it has a large number of European immigrants that are attracted to the state with Germans predominating. So there's a lot of Germans, including exclusive German enclaves in places like Fredericksburg and New Braunfels, uh, even in Austin County, north and uh, west of Houston. Um, So people are living in the east. Uh, They're not heading out to the frontier because it's tough to pursue a plantation uh, economy out there. And uh, they're coming from all over the South and even Europe. Now, we think of Texans as being frontiersmen. Well, they're not really the same kind of frontiersmen as Texans were, Texians were in the 1820s. Instead, these people are advancing the cotton frontier. So who's really running things? That would be the women. The women run the household. The women really direct how uh, society is going to be woven together. Well, as Southerners, they were especially susceptible to the idea of the cult of true womanhood. A Texas woman was expected to be both a homemaker and a mother, pious and pure, strong and hardworking, docile and submissive, Uh, and in many ways, be put upon a pedestal. But there are some limitations to this. When these women are very strong in those spheres, they are also excluded from some of the more public spheres, including politics. There are no political rights for women in the 1850s in Texas. And so, as a result, women often suffered... uh, inequities before the law. For instance, women could not serve on juries, they couldn't act as lawyers, and they couldn't even witness a will. As the old saying goes, in the 1850s, Texas was heaven for men and dogs and hell for women and horses. Well, it's not all bad news for the women because women did have a significant amount of property rights in Texas. Married women could maintain title to property, such as land and slaves, that they owned before marriage. Uh, Married women also had community property rights to property that had been acquired during the course of the marriage in case their husband died or ran off or something like that. Uh, These rights allowed Texas women to head families, own plantations, uh, manage estates in ways that were anything but passive and submissive. So while they may have been expected to be docile and submissive, they had mechanisms in their lives that would allow them to express their own unique individuality. Well, one of the things that the women of Texas were very keen on was making their families, helping their families attend church. Uh, What kind of churches were in Texas? There's more Methodists than Baptists, but that's the first and second denominations, followed by Presbyterians, Cumberland Presbyterians, there's Catholics, there's Lutherans, there's uh, the um, Christian Church, now Disciples of Christ and Churches of Christ. A lot of the Protestant denominations are represented, but there's more Methodists and Baptists than everybody else. Now, what did these Texas churches do in the 1850s? They were the center pieces of communities. They provided not only spiritual and moral guidance, which you would expect from church, but they also tended to be advocates for education. And so churches had a very important social um, interaction uh, capacity as well. Besides, church is where you met your wife. Church is where you went for the picnic. 
church was a big social outlet as well. Okay, so can 1850s Texans read and write? The answer is, by and large, yes, they could. Uh, remarkably literate people, Texans in the 1850s. Uh, what did they read? Well, one of the things they read were newspapers. There's quite a few pretty important newspapers that start up in the 1850s or roll into the 1850s, including the Telegraph and Texas Register out of Houston, the Galveston Daily News, the Austin State Gazette. Uh, there's also important newspapers in Marshall, Clarksville, and Nacogdoches. Um, now, these children, how do they become literate? By and large, through private education, uh, some sort of subscription school. Texas and Texans tried to advocate for a free public school system in the 1850s, but it fell short. They figured out that they were never going to be able to capitalize it at a level to make it work at that time. That'll lay in the future. So, you've got a fairly educated bunch, but education is going to be something that you pay for and go get yourself. Well, all right, so you got a reading bunch that are reading the newspaper, and they're going to church. What else are they doing in Texas in the 1850s? Well, there's actually um, a trend towards amateur theatrics. Uh, people put on a show. Uh, there's debating societies in many communities. Uh, there's music recitals. But Texans, being Southerners, also spend an awful lot of time thinking about racing horses, gambling, recreational drinking, and fighting. So, Texas in many ways, is just an extension of the American South.